Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, unseated, breaking overnight political payback for Donald Trump. As his most outspoken Republican critic, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, concedes defeat in the Wyoming primaries while defending her stance against the former president. I have said since January 6th that I will do whatever it takes to ensure Donald Trump is never again anywhere near the Oval Office, and I mean it. Also breaking in Alaska, two Republican rivals, Trump critic Senator Lisa Murkowski and Trump endorsed Kelly Shabaka, now set to go head to head in November. We have team coverage with the latest returns, plus what this could mean about Trump's influence on the GOP. One year later, as America marks the first anniversary of the deadly Afghanistan troop withdrawal, the general in charge of the operation is now speaking out. What he's saying about the controversial exit, the chaotic aftermath, and the lives lost. Game changer, a major move that could impact millions of Americans. The FDA clearing the way for over-the-counter hearing aids, making them cheaper and more accessible than ever. More on the decision and how soon you can get the devices without a prescription. And Jill of all trades. She's done just about everything in front of and behind the camera in this week's Women Mean Business. We'll talk to movie executive Cece Cleary about her impressive decades-long career in entertainment and how she found success in a male-dominated industry. And I have a feeling, once again, we'll be taking notes during Women Mean Business. Lots of advice. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We do have a lot of breaking news this morning, though, beginning with those election results from Wyoming and Alaska, highlighting the influence of former President Trump on the Republican Party. In Wyoming, Congresswoman Liz Cheney decisively lost the GOP primary for the House seat that she first won back in 2016, a seat that once belonged to her father, former Vice President Dick Cheney. She was defeated by Harriet Hageman, who was backed by Trump and has supported his unfounded claims that the 2020 election was stolen. Congresswoman Cheney, the former number three House Republican, became Trump's top target after she voted for his impeachment in 2021 and for her role on the January 6th committee. And in the Alaska Senate race, another high-profile Republican Trump critic, incumbent Lisa Murkowski, advanced to a runoff this fall, along with Trump's pick, Kelly Shabaka, and two other candidates. Murkowski is one of seven Republican senators who voted to convict the former president in his second impeachment trial, and the only one who will be on the ballot this November. We're covering it all with NBC News political editor Mark Murray and NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard, who joins us from Jackson, Wyoming. Good morning to both of you. Mark, let's start with you in that House race in Wyoming. Cheney was expected to lose the primary, but the numbers here are pretty astounding, considering her former status as a leader in the Republican Party and her famous family name in the state of Wyoming. So what should we know about Cheney's defeat and the successful ca campaign that was run by Hageman? Yeah, uh, Cheney's defeat was a blowout, uh, Joe. And as you ended up showing, uh, the margin was more than a two to one margin. And you, you, all, you usually don't see that when a incumbent is running for reelection particularly in a primary. And we have seen Republicans uh, 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 defeat uh, Donald Trump-backed supporters in primary challenges. We saw Brian Kemp being able to do that in Georgia, Nancy Mace in South Carolina. But Liz Cheney's was a kind of a different brand, and she was has been cooperating with the Democrats on the January 6th committee and ended up paying a price for that. As for Harriet Hageman, who ended up winning last night's Republican primary, she was running on a message, not only that she was backed by uh, the former president, Donald Trump, but also that Liz Cheney just wasn't representing her constituents in deep red Wyoming. Take a listen to some of her remarks from last night. Wyoming has spoken on behalf of everyone who is concerned that the game is becoming more and more rigged against them. Yeah. And what Wyoming has shown today is that while it may not be easy, we can dislodge entrenched politicians who believe they've risen above the people they are supposed to represent and serve. 
But Joe, you know, Liz Cheney, we haven't heard the last from her at all. Uh, she continues to serve on the House uh, January 6th committee. They are promising more hearings as we end up getting to the fall. And so while Liz Cheney ended up losing her primary, I don't necessarily think she's going away anytime soon. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that now. So, Vaughn, first of all, former President Trump responded to this race on his social media platform, Truth Social. He said, quote, Liz Cheney should be ashamed of herself, adding now she can disappear into the depths of political oblivion where she will be much happier. But let's be clear, Cheney gave a very impassioned concession speech that maybe doesn't signal she's going away. Tell us more about that and what her next steps might be. Right, Joe. I've been over the years to quite a few concession speeches, election night watch parties that have uh, welcomed a candidate onto stage who is staring at defeat and you could say political uh, irrelevancy. In the case of Liz Cheney, last night was it was frankly a little weird. Uh, you're looking at somebody who lost uh, at the hands of her own neighbors in her own backyard by more than or by almost 40 percentage points. And yet it was clear that this is only the beginning of Liz Cheney's battle. She has made it clear that she intends to wage a much longer and larger fight ahead to make sure Donald Trump is never back in the White House. Take a little uh, listen to a little bit, a few, a few of her remarks from last night. No House seat, no office in this land is more important than the principles that we are all sworn to protect. And I well understood the potential political consequences of abiding by my duty. The great and original champion of our party, Abraham Lincoln, was defeated in elections for the Senate and the House before he won the most important election of all. Lincoln ultimately prevailed he saved our union, and he defined our obligation as Americans for all of history. If we do not condemn the conspiracies and the lies, if we do not hold those responsible to account, we will be excusing this conduct, and it will become a feature of all elections. America will never be the same. Allies of Cheney made it clear over the last year and a half, Joe, that she would not capitulate or change her ways or her position to Donald Trump for political expediency. And as a result, you saw her lose at the hands of Republican voters who overwhelmingly went for the trump back candidate, Harriet Hageman. We will hear more from Cheney in the next hour. Mark, let's talk about the Alaska Senate race. This was an open primary, which means it includes candidates from all parties, with the top four now going on to the general election this November. And it looks like it's going to be a showdown between the incumbent, Senator Lisa Murkowski, and Kelly Shabaka, who was endorsed by Trump. Uh, what's your takeaway from the primary results here, and what do we expect from this big election come fall? Yeah, Joe, my takeaway is that we're going to have to wait until November. And the overall margin was pretty close between Lisa Murkowski, who ended up emerging with the most votes last night in last uh, night's top four primary. Uh, you ended up having Kelly Shabaka uh, uh, with second, but trailing about by four percentage points. And then this, you know, the top four candidates advanced to November. And then we're going to end up seeing ranked choice voting if no one secures a majority in November. And that will take weeks to count. And so this this is uh, just the first stage in Alaska, and we'll get a final word in either November or maybe even December. And Vaughn, let's be clear. These, these unfounded claims about the 2020 election are going to be on the ballot come November. What should we expect in some of these campaigns where that's an issue? Right. Over the last four or five months, we have seen these candidates who have echoed and propagated the 2020 election conspiracies brought to the forefront by Donald Trump. They have won these primaries. A majority of Republican voters in so many of these states have selected among multiple Republican candidates those who have echoed those conspiracy theories that the 2020 election was rigged and stolen. And that's why I think that Liz Cheney, she has that network built in. And as you heard in her speech, she made it clear that she's not going away. Well, we have seen other members of Congress lose their primaries, other statewide office holders lose theirs. Liz Cheney intends to be a part of the fold. And it's been even suggested that she could have her own 2024 presidential run or build up a super PAC or an outside organization to try to push back against the Republican Party that has changed so drastically over the 20 years since her father served as vice president in the Bush Cheney administration. Joe. Ron Hilliard, Mark Murray, thank you both. Appreciate it. Now to the latest on the investigation surrounding the search of Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. The federal judge in Florida who approved the search warrant 
on the former president's home was scheduled a hearing to determine if the underlying affidavit used to justify the search should be unsealed to the public. The Department of Justice is arguing against making the affidavit public, while news organizations, including NBC News, and also Donald Trump himself, are pushing for its release. Let's bring in NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas for more on this. Good morning to both of you. Thanks for being here. Ryan, I'll start with you. So what more can you tell us about the arguments both sides will be making during this hearing? Yeah, it's essentially an alignment between uh, the media and Donald Trump, uh, unusually, in this in this case. I think that both, both sides are going to be arguing for sort of more information for this to come out. Um, DOJ would obviously, even if this did come out, need to make some major redactions to it. But they don't want it to come out at all because they say that, you know, the redactions that they would need to make would essentially take a lot of the context out. And additionally, um, it would offer a roadmap, essentially, to Donald Trump about where this investigation is headed. Uh, it could also um, maybe make witnesses less likely to come forward and be willing to cooperate. You know, we've already seen instances of the FBI agents who were involved in the search and Mar-a-Lago be targeted uh, by Trump supporters. So I think that they want to make sure that uh, more information uh, doesn't come out that is both a threat to those officers and also that might give Donald Trump a sense of where exactly this investigation is headed. Danny, talk to us about what the implications could be here, no matter what happens, if the affidavit is released or if it stays sealed. First, the affidavit of probable cause is going to stay sealed. If this were a normal case with just a normal, regular guy involved, uh, there wouldn't even be a hearing. The judge would decide it on the papers or deny the motion outright. And I say that with a, quite a bit of disappointment because, like the media attorneys pushing to have the, the uh, affidavit of probable cause released, I want to see it. A lot of us want to see it. <clears throat> DOJ knows that uh, because that's why they're opposing it. They keep their investigations secret unless and until they hand up an indictment then they'll have a press conference but uh doj never releases search warrant uh, affidavits of probable cause even releasing uh, or unsealing the search warrant and the property receipt was unusual but not that wild because the search warrant becomes property of the person like trump he can release it if he wants or leak it so that was no big surprise but the affidavit of probable cause is a summary written to the judge to explain to the judge why there's probable cause, uh, why there is evidence of criminality at the property to be searched. So it's a narrative explaining the evidence found to date in a persuasive way. It's a terrific piece of information <clears throat> for defense attorneys like me. It's one of the first things I go to when I get discovery, but you don't get discovery unless there's an indictment. Mm. Now, we're also, we also know that Attorney General Merrick Garland approved this himself. We heard that in that press conference last week. But we're getting more information, really, about what went into this decision. A senior official at the Department of Justice told NBC News that the attorney general wrestled with it for weeks before authorizing it. Ryan, tell us the latest on our reporting there. Yeah, you know, this is a pretty monumental decision, and Garland knew that this was going to be consequential for when exactly how this would go forward. He knew that this would be obviously divisive. Um, although DOJ would note, uh, continue to note that they tried to keep this as quiet as they could and give basically uh, the president that option of not making this public. And first, they went down this this trajectory where they did this sort of on a more co not so much cooperative, but rather on a quieter uh, way without an enforced subpoena that uh, uh, rather, with a subpoena rather, of course, in the search warrant, which is what they went in with uh, eventually. But, you know, Garland has made clear that this was his decision and his decision alone. And I believe we have uh, some audio from him uh, here talking about why he made the decision. Um, he said that um, First, I personally approve this decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. Second, the department does not take such a decision lightly, is what he said at that press conference last or a couple weeks ago. Danny, what does this approach tell you about how the Department of Justice is handling this investigation overall? They're handling it differently than they normally do, uh, because normally there is no comment on a pending investigation. There is no press conference. There is no statement. Uh, there is no agreement to release the search warrant and the property receipt, even though those things could be leaked by the person that they hand it to when they ex execute the search warrant. So the DOJ is not uh, following their standard practice, but I have to give them credit because that press conference that Merrick Garland had was a brilliant example of commenting but not commenting on an ongoing investigation. The first part of it was 
uh, thanking the brave men and women of the FBI and the DOJ, that chunk, uh, which is pretty standard and didn't have anything to do with the investigation. Then the second part was basically, we will agree to unseal two documents that Trump probably could have unsealed himself once he got his hands on them and released them. So basically, he defended uh, the people under his command and did something that wasn't that shocking because it probably would have come out anyway. That affidavit of probable cause, on the other hand, that is something that they will oppose and that the judge is just not going to release unless, like all these other cases involving Trump, they don't follow the standard rules. Mm. All right, Danny Savalos and Ron Riley, thank you so much. And legal problems are growing for one of the former president's top associates, Rudy Giuliani. He is set to testify today before a grand jury as investigations intensify in Georgia around attempts there to overturn the 2020 election. According to his attorney, Giuliani was told Monday that he was a target in a criminal investigation into the state's election interference case. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now live in front of the courthouse in Fulton County, Georgia with the latest. Blaine, good morning to you. So what do we know about where things stand today as Giuliani gets ready to testify, and, and do we know if anyone else is also slated to testify? Well, Joe, good morning to you. We do know that he is going to be appearing today behind closed doors before that special grand jury. In fact, his lawyer confirmed as much to NBC News. And there were certainly some question marks around this, whether or not he would actually come down here and testify in person. Uh, just a week ago, his attorney, his local attorney, was in court behind me, uh, essentially saying that doctors had said that because of recent heart procedures, it wasn't good for his health to take a flight down here. Well, the judge responded and said, you know what, if it's not good for his health to fly, there are other ways to get down here. You can come by a coach. You can come by train. Uh, break it up into legs if you need to. Just do whatever you need to do in order to get here. Now, the judge did leave open some of the door to say, hey, if you can produce a more detailed doctor's note to say why you shouldn't come down, we can consider pushing the date. That note wasn't produced, and we know that he's going to be here today. Now, remember, this is all closed proceeding. This is happening behind closed doors. But all of this centers around uh, Giuliani's statements that he made back in December of 2020, just on the heels of the 2020 presidential election, where he was speaking to a number of Georgia lawmakers in front of a legislative panel here and essentially peddled a number of false claims about the election, saying, uh, singling out two election workers, saying that they were involved in an elaborate plot to throw the election in Biden's favor. That was not the case. They received death threats because of that. Uh, he made claims about the state's uh, voting machines and suitcases and things like that. All of those are things that we expect him to be questioned on today. Now, he's already indicated through his attorney that he doesn't plan to answer any questions about conversations that he had with the former president, former President Trump. Uh, his attorney told NBC News that Giuliani will likely invoke attorney-client privilege uh, on any of those conversations, Joe. Yeah, Blaine, let's talk more about that. I mean, I know last month you spoke to the Fulton County District Attorney about the importance of having Trump's associates testify. But like you said, Giuliani's lawyer said his client is probably going to invoke attorney-client privilege if asked about his conversations with Trump. So how is that going to impact the grand jury and their ability to get the full picture. You know, when I spoke with Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, she made it clear that she is going to subpoena and try and bring down anybody and everybody who has any sort of information that she believes would be beneficial for the grand jury to hear. She says anybody who knows anything uh, about the former president's actions, his mindset, anything around that time, she wants the grand jury to hear from those individuals. Here's what she told me when I asked her, why is it important to hear from Rudy Giuliani, from Senator Lindsey Graham, who she's also subpoenaed, and other Trump associates? Take a look. What is important is that the grand jurors hear from anyone that may have impacted this election. I think that they deserve to get a full picture, and so what we are trying to do is give them a full picture. And Joe, what she also told me during that exclusive interview last month is that she's not ruling out issuing subpoenas to close associates, former White House officials of former President Trump, and even subpoenaing the former president himself, Joe. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you so much. Time now for weather and dangerously high temperatures that are expected again today in the West. Michelle Grossman is now with us with more on that. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Good morning. And yeah, that's going to be the major weather headline today. Also tomorrow throughout the end of the week, we're looking at 21 million people impacted by heat advisory or excessive heat warning along the uh, West Coast from Washington to Oregon, California, even into Idaho, where you see the pink color. That's where we're looking at excessive heat warning. We're looking at temperatures into the triple digits in many spots, Fresno and Bakersfield. We'll be 
be sizzling today. So here's a setup. We have the jet stream so far to the north. That's allowing the heat in. So we're looking at temperatures in the upper 90s in Portland. Notice 19 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. So this is not normal. We're looking at 105 in Medford, 105 in Sacramento, 102 today in Boise and Billings. We're looking at 95. So as we head towards the east, it's sort of that contrast, that temperature contrast. Really nice today. We had really nice a uh, couple past days. We're looking tomorrow at temperatures with that jet stream dip so low to the south, bringing in that cooler air. So we're looking at 84 in uh, St. Louis, Lexington 84, 85 in Little Rock, and even down to Atlanta, 80 degrees. That's eight degrees below what is average for this time of year. As we go throughout the rest of the week, it's not going to be too bad. It's going to be a little bit warmer, but really average for this time of year. So D.C., the upper 80s on Friday, but really nice weekend once again. We'll add in the humidity, though, over the weekend as opposed to last weekend. Now, we're also looking at the chance for scattered storms along the southeast. We have a really slow-moving cold front. I'll show you that in just a minute. Also looking at monsoon moisture in the southwest. We're going to see them firing, those storms firing up later on this afternoon once again. But those southeast downpours, we had a water spout in Destin, Florida yesterday. Really crazy image if you haven't seen it yet. But as we look at this cold front, it's going to sink really slowly to the south, and we're looking at heat and humidity fueling some storms. And we could see up to three inches, some locally heavy rain in some spots. Back to you guys. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Michelle. And now to the drought crisis gripping the West. A decision announced Tuesday means Arizona and Nevada will soon get less water from the Colorado River, a major source of drinking water and irrigation for the Southwest. But the pain will be felt across the country. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has more. In the grips of a prolonged and historic drought, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation announcing unprecedented water cuts to states along the Colorado River, the lifeblood of the American West, serving some 40 million people. Facing a Tier 2 shortage for the first time in history, authorities say in January, Arizona will lose 21 percent of its yearly water allocation from the river as Nevada loses 8 percent. It's complex problems, not only in natural resources, but politically, economically, socially. Climate change has only intensified a 23-year mega drought in the now critically low water levels, snaking from the Rocky Mountains through the parched southwest. The river water sustains some of the largest cities in the country, but some 80 percent is used to grow produce that feeds the nation. We must be conscious of the fact that we deal with finite resources and we need to to manage accordingly. Downriver Lake Powell and Lake Mead are just a quarter full. Hydropower production could soon be threatened. Water cuts made by the federal government come after the seven states involved couldn't reach an agreement on their own. Future cuts impacting even more states seem inevitable. Hoping to avoid a catastrophic river collapse, Arizona and Nevada face a tightening tap, a crisis threatening to trickle down to more of the country. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. This week marks one year since the Taliban seized control of Afghanistan. The sweeping power grab led to a chaotic withdrawal of U.S. troops, which brought an end to America's longest running war. One year later, the former general in charge of Afghanistan and the withdrawal is speaking out and reflecting on that controversial moment. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby spoke with retired General Frank McKenzie and joins us now. Courtney, always great to see you. So it's fair to say the general disagreed with the decision to pull out all U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Is that right? That's absolutely right. So he's testified to that, but he gave us a little bit more insight into exactly what he recommended before the president decided to pull all U.S. troops out. He said that he and the U.S. Central Com Command recommendation was to maintain a presence of about 2,500 U.S. troops. And he said that that actually would have allowed the U.S. to keep Bagram Air Base open, which was something that was very controversial during last summer during the withdrawal that the U.S. had closed it. Uh, he maintains that with that 2,500 troops and the NATO presence, which would have likely been several thousand troops, and then contractors, that the U.S. could have helped the Afghan government hold up and, and keep the, na the Afghan National Defense Forces, the military and the police, from collapsing and the Taliban ultimately taking over that country. But here he explained a little bit about why he and CENTCOM believed that 2,500 was what he called a survivable number for them in Afghanistan. 
I felt that uh, that was a number that we would be able to continue to provide a level of support at a very high level to the Afghan military and, and particularly have given them the necessary level of support that would have been required for us to continue CT, counterterrorism operations, against al-Qaeda and against ISIS. The position of the U.S. Central Command in my position was that was a survivable number. We do know, however, what the alternative to that was, which was withdrawal, and that's not a future contingency. We know as a matter of history that that was disastrous. And he's... General McKenzie, now retired, uh, Frank McKenzie, working down at University of South Florida, he says that, uh, that the decision to, to the announcement, really, to pull all troops out that was made in April of 2021, that that set off a series of events, set things in motion that ultimately led to the withdrawal being, as what he called it, disastrous, Savannah and Joe. So, Courtney, looking back at the events of last year, does the general have any regrets about how that troop withdrawal was handled? He does. I mean, the biggest thing that he talks about is that he wishes that the U.S. had started getting Americans out of that country earlier. But he said that the, he, he's, you know, as I said, he's now retired. He says that every single day he thinks about what was happening at this time last year, that he's really haunted by it. Uh, but here's what he had to say about it. I've thought about it every day. It's something that uh, that I spent a lot of time a lot of time considering the lost opportunities. You know what it meant the loss the loss of human beings, American and others that occurred over not only the last part of the evacuation but also the course of a 20-year war. I think uh, we wanted to have it all. We wanted to withdraw and essentially go to zero, and yet maintain a diplomatic platform in the country, and that was not feasible. I think the U.S. failure in Afghanistan was not the failure solely of the U.S. military, although we certainly bear responsibility for that, but a whole of government approach that simply failed. He also talks about this as what he says was a whole of government failure in Afghanistan. And it's really sad, I have to tell you, to hear him repeatedly talk about the war in Afghanistan ultimately as a failure is pretty striking from a military general. But he said that it was a whole of government failure. And what that means is that from the very beginning, the military component not getting Osama bin Laden early on in the conflict to President Obama making a decision and an announcement that the U.S. was going to withdraw, then ultimately to the signing of the Doha Agreement, which, uh, which also made an announcement that the U.S. was going to withdraw. He said that those were catastrophic decisions because they really degraded the confidence of the Afghan government and the Afghan military and then ultimately of the people in their government institutions. All right, Courtney, thank you so much. More international headlines now, starting in Crimea, where more explosions were reported at a Russian weapons depot. But Ukraine has stopped short of claiming responsibility. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Ukraine with the latest on that and more. Hey, Josh, good morning. Good morning, guys. Russia is blaming sabotage for that explosion at that ammunition depot, uh, but it appears to have been deep in Russian-occupied territory in Crimea, suspected to be a Russian attack. Ukraine's military, though, is being coy about whether it was responsible, saying only that the explosions make everyone in Ukraine happy. President Zelensky hinting at more to come, urging Ukrainians still living in Crimea to avoid Russian military bases. Now to North Korea, which fired two cruise missiles into the sea this morning as the country flexes its military might. It's unclear how far or how high they flew, but it comes as North Korea's rival, South Korea, called for diplomacy, while also starting four days of joint military drills with the United States. And in Australia, scientists hope to bring back an animal from extinction. The Tasmanian tiger used to roam the Australian bush, but disappeared in the 1930s. Now geneticists plan to resurrect it using an advanced DNA technology and artificial reproduction. I'm just hoping that they don't try that with dinosaurs next. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Maybe the Dress small park, dinosaurs. Yeah. Small dinosaurs. Wow, yeah. that's so interesting. We're back with an announcement from the FDA that will impact millions of Americans. The agency says it will allow hearing aids to be made available over the counter without the need for costly medical exams or prescriptions. This has actually been a long time coming. Congress passed legislation requiring the FDA to create a category for over-the-counter hearing aids way back in 2017, but it's only just now being implemented. Now, this will just be for people with mild to moderate hearing problems, but these devices should hit drugstores as early as mid-October. For more, we're joined by 
NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar here on set with us. So just walk us through the impact of this announcement. I mean, to not need a prescription sounds like a pretty big deal. It, it is a pretty big deal. I mean, I think the, the FDA says that about 30 million Americans would qualify, be candidates for this if wow. they have mild to moderate hearing loss. And only about 14 percent of those people actually seek you know, uh, assessment for this. It's a really expensive process. I mean, a, a set of hearing aids, a pair of hearing aids can cost people about $5,000. They haven't committed to say exactly how much savings there will be, but mm. it could be, it could be, we're talking about half the cost. I mean, Medicare, don't get me started, you know, on what it does not cover. It doesn't co right. cover dental and, and things like this. And this is, you know, predominant. I mean, it affects younger people, but we're talking about a lot of seniors who would be impacted by this. Yeah. So the benefits are pretty clear. I, I did a story on this a few years yeah. ago when they were looking into it and, and heard plenty from the hearing aid industry who's yes. deeply opposed to this. Yes. Why has it mm. taken it so long to get You know, here? if you look back for people who are interested in how things go from an idea to actual policy, um, it was quite a journey, quite a, a meandering, serpentine thing we sort of said it in the lead. In 2017, Congress passed legislation that said, you know, we would like to have more competition in the market. And the Trump administration actually signed that into law. But it wasn't until last July when President Biden signed an executive order that really prompted the FDA to put this ruling out for public mm. comment. And they got a lot of comments, Joe, as you can <laughs> well imagine, you know, from consumer advocates, medical experts and everything. And I think that their feeling is that this will create more competition in the field. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, for a lot of folks who have, again, the mild to moderate, and I think it's important for people to understand what does that actually mean to have right. mild yeah. to moderate. So it's basically like you're having difficulty hearing when there's background noise. You're having difficulty hearing on the telephone. Um, friends and family are asking you to repeat, you know, or you're asking your friends and family to repeat. It's not for people with severe hearing loss. But suffice it to say, you know, it took six years. I think in the big scheme of things, that's actually not that long. You know, I yeah. mean, it takes a long time for things like yeah. this to happen. But yes, you don't know. You no longer will need to see an audiologist. Um, and so, you know, the audiologists are going to say, well, we do. They do serve a purpose. Right. But one of the things that I think is important for viewers to understand is that there's a lot of questions that you should probably be asking. Hearingloss.org is a great website mm -hmm. for things to understand, like, what's the warranty? Do you need a smartphone mm. app to use this? Can you amplify the sound or not? Like, you know, without the aid, without the help, yeah. no pun intended, <laughs> of, of an audiologist, you, you might have some difficulty navigating this at first. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. So yeah. it's only for that mild to moderate. It is. More severe cases, not. Why is that? And what does it mean if you, if you so, are at the more severe end? Yeah. So if you are at the more severe end, I think you absolutely need a consultation. Remember, you can, you can do this for, with mild to moderate, without a prescription, and without an exam, which you know, as a medical professional, like I, and I'm always a little nervous about telling people go out and, and have this for yourself. But the thing is with the FDA, they have set regulations on how loud you can amplify the sound. So I don't think it's dangerous for people mm. to do this, but I would also argue that you may not be getting the best fit or the best sound or the best thing. And so if you're not satisfied with your over-the-counter product, you absolutely should should seek, you know, a professional consultation. It's also not indicated for kids, for kids who need hearing mm. aids. They also need to go through the traditional channels. Yeah. Definitely a big change. Welcome back. I just love that graphic. As you just saw, it's time for another edition of our series, Women Mean Business. And just wait until you hear today's guest resume. Cece Cleary has worked as a producer, actor, stunt woman, sports model, and professional athlete. After graduating from the University of Vermont, Cleary moved to Hawaii and became a professional big wave windsurfer in Maui. She was one of the first women in the world to kite surf in Hawaii and also participated in the Olympic trials in 2004. She broke into the movie industry, working behind the camera on commercials and music videos. Recently, she was involved in the movie To Leslie, which The Hollywood Reporter described as, quote, searingly low-key and beautifully acted. She's currently the development executive for Blue Water Lane Productions. Cece Cleary is clearly a woman who means business, and Cece joins us now. Cece, thanks so much for being here this morning. So just, I want to hear a little bit about your path and how you got here. I mean, windsurfing, stunt double. We saw a picture of you on a horse there. You've done it all, and now in the movie industry, so many different roles. Did you know that you wanted to end up where you are now? And just tell me a little bit about the path along the way. I think I knew when I was doing stunt work in Hawaii, I did a lot of film stunt work and I just fell in love with the movie business. And so I kept doing stunt work as long as I could. And then I got into scouting locations and I did PA work. 
I did whatever job I could on the set just to learn, to find my place. And I think I always knew it was producing. It just took a while to get there. Absolutely. As I think it feels a lot of the time for all of us that it takes a while to get to where we ultimately want to be. And I'm going to ask you for some advice at the end of this. Um, but let's talk about one of your latest films to Leslie. You've described it as the type of story you like to tell as it matters and makes a difference. Tell us what you mean by that and also the importance for you in the position that you're in to tell stories like that. Um, yes, it, we picked it for various reasons. One is a story that makes a difference. It's about humanity, and it also talks about addiction, which I think everybody has experienced someone in their life that has some sort of situation like that. And it's it's humanity. Part of the story, uh, a perfect stranger it helps this person. So that, that was one of the reasons we picked it. And the acting's amazing. Andrea Riceboro, I've never seen a performance like that in my life. I was on set every day. And Michael Morris, the director, is one of the best directors that I've ever worked with. So it was a really positive experience. I'm really, we shot it during COVID, which was very challenging. Mm, absolutely. And obviously just powerhouses both behind and in front of the camera. It's so cool. Um, you know, as we've been doing this series, one of the questions that comes up, which is interesting because we have had such a variation of women interviewed here, is what's it like in a male-dominated industry? And I preface it that way just because a lot of industries are just that. But I wonder what it was like coming up for you within the entertainment movie industry. And if there's any changes you hope to see moving forward or that you're sort of actively working on. Yes, it is. It is challenging because there are only 30 percent of uh, females are producers. So I work with mostly men. So I had to really prove myself. But the men I've worked with have been great. They've been supportive. But you do have to prove yourself every day. You're only as good as your last act. And advice for women breaking into it, I, I would just say, you know, keep, keep working at it. Just prove yourself and you'll succeed. Is there anything you wish you could go back and tell a younger you who maybe was in the middle of switching up your careers or just starting out in the movie industry that, that you wish you would have known then that now you'd love to be able to go back and tell her? Yes, ask for help. It, mm. You know, it's you don't have to know everything, and to identify what you don't know and find a mentor, and just say, "I don't know this. Could you teach me?" Or delegate and say, "I can't do everything. You can't know every area of the business of production and making a movie. It's so complicated, and there's so many different facets." I wish I had reached out earlier, and you don't always have to be the smartest person in the room. Mm. You're actually smarter if you're not the smartest person in the room. Such a good point. Knowing what you don't know, so important. And asking for help, something that sometimes can be tough, but a great reminder. CC Cleary, thank you so much. Wonderful to meet you and to get to talk to you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Financial headlines now. The U.S. government has released the details of a new tax incentive for electric vehicles, and not all cars are going to qualify. Yes, CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with the details on that and other financial headlines this morning. Hey, Bertha. Hey, good morning, Joe and Savannah. Yeah, the ink is barely dry on the Inflation Reduction Act, and one of the features is already up and running. People who want to buy electric vehicles can take a look on a number of websites that are available to help determine just which cars qualify for the credits of up to $7,500. At least 21 models are eligible, including the Ford F-150 Lightning, Mustang Mach-E, and BMW 3 Series plug-ins. Now, Teslas are not because Teslas have already had their tax credits and that uh, tax credit period has expired. Meantime, Amazon is raising fees on third-party sellers who use the company's fulfillment services to pack and ship orders. From mid-October to mid-January during that big uh, holiday peak, sellers will be hit with an average fee of 35 cents per item. It's the second fee imposed by Amazon this year, which is following the steps of uh, FedEx and UPS. Back in April, it added a 5% fuel and inflation surcharge to offset rising gas prices, shipping, and labor costs. 
And the parent company of Regal Cinema says a lack of blockbuster movies is hurting ticket sales. Cineworld says the problem will likely persist until November. The world's second largest theater chain was hoping big budget films like Top Gun Maverick and Jurassic World would help reduce its mountain of debt. But Hollywood has released fewer movies than a typical summer due in part to production issues during the pandemic. So you don't have a lot of those big Avengers series yeah. out there getting people to the movies. Yeah, but which is hard to believe there aren't of many things. of those right I, now. I know, <laughs> you know, right? They usually come out every I know, other right? week. I know. I know. <laughs> which one is this to compare? You get that one. Top Gun Maverick, though. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Tom, Tom, Tom Cruise is going to so, have to make the next one. Yeah, I've got to get to the theaters to see that. Oh, Bertha, you haven't seen it? Go, go, go. Run, run, run. <laughs> right no, now. Late. Right now. Go. <laughs> we excuse Thanks, you. Bertha. Thank you, Bertha. Public libraries, especially in rural counties, are dealing with a new challenge. Some state legislators are passing laws that critics say will politicize libraries, like in Lawrence County, Kentucky. NBC News reporter Julie Serkin shows us what's happening there and across the country. In an area like this that is very rural, very low socioeconomic, exposing kids to diversity, inclusiveness, uh, in whatever way that may be, is of the utmost importance. Carly Pelfrey is at the helm of the Lawrence County Public Library in Eastern Kentucky. Gosh, the growth here in our library with our collection, with our staff, um, with our patrons, the county population has seen a little bit of growth too. A lot of positive changes. Um, also some changes that are a little concerning. In April, legislators in the Bluegrass State overrode the governor's veto, approving SB 167, which will transform public library boards by turning over power to local county judges. Prior to this bill, libraries were politically neutral. You know, our boards were neutral. We had no affiliation with a political party or a candidate or an elected official, and that's gonna change. Public libraries across the U.S. are being challenged on funding and censorship. We've never witnessed the volume of challenges reported to our office in almost 20 years. Um, we had 729 challenges reported to us in 2021. The typical number reported in a year is less than half of that, according to Deborah Caldwell-Stone, who oversees the Office of Intellectual Freedom for the American Library Association. What we're seeing is this attack on books that represent groups that have been traditionally marginalized in our communities, um, just as they're finding a place on the public stage. Back in Kentucky, supporters of the bill here say it isn't meant to politicize libraries, but restore accountability to taxpayers instead. Censorship wasn't even discussed. It was how is this money appropriately spent? Now, if the counties choose to adopt the new appointment system and a different board gets on there, they're going to look at different content very possible. I can't tell you that that won't happen. State Senator Philip Wheeler represents this district and he helped shepherd this legislation across the finish line. It'll go into effect early next year. I think what the problem is under the current system, it goes back to a really a lack of diversity and outlook and diversity and opinion. Under the new law, counties will have the choice to opt out of the new system. If the county chooses to do nothing, the status quo reigns. The legislation could give fiscal control of libraries to local officials, raising alarm in rural regions like Lawrence County, a community of 16,000. A lot of our lawmakers, a lot of our legislatures are so out of touch with what public libraries actually do. Beyond the usual books and DVDs, this library provides free lunches for kids during the summer. And with broadband inaccessible in some areas, they also provide internet and resources families may not have. I didn't have a computer to use for college and I would come here to work. No other entity in town is putting on any free programs, any activities for the kids. The trickle down effect will affect our boards. It'll affect our budgets. And if we don't have the funding to provide these kinds of services, then what happens? Officials in Campbell County, Wyoming, voted to defund the local library in May, saying it lacked transparency around how it buys and discards books. But critics say it's their way of banning books they deem inappropriate. We're actually seeing efforts to target school board elections and library board elections. School libraries in Tennessee are now controlled by the State Board of Education instead of local boards after a bill was passed in April. It's really um, sometimes frightening to see this effort to 
use public libraries as, and school libraries as tools of indoctrination. In Jamestown Township, Michigan, voters rejected a property tax that makes up 84 percent of the local library's annual budget. Officials say this will likely force the library to close. It really is insidious in every way, and it goes so far beyond funding. Our thanks to Julie Sirkin for that report. It's worth noting in 2021, the average number of challenges reported to the American Library Association over funding and censorship more than doubled. If you're looking to switch your breakfast bagel for a healthier option, well, here is an option for you you may not have considered chocolate ice cream. A new food nutrition guide from Tufts University says chocolate ice cream in a cone topped with nuts beats a whole grain bagel with raisins when it comes to overall nutrition. The so-called food compass uses a 100 point scale to rank all kinds of food from corn chips to cappuccinos. And in fact, cappuccino does rank higher than corn chips, by the way. The charts designers say most people understand the basics of food nutrition, but can get confused with more complex or processed foods. I hope this compass will help guide people toward healthier choices. I mean, I guess to be clear, I never thought my morning bagel with cream cheese was healthy. <laughs> okay, you can have chocolate ice cream and a cone, and it's not as bad. It's better than a whole wheat even bagel. I guess, yeah. You know. Okay, so I guess bagels are just. I'm not super surprised. I don't. I never looked at a bagel and thought, oh, this is the healthy yeah. choice I'm having this morning. Yeah. But, you know. You know, people like scoop them out and do all that crazy stuff just to keep. <laughs> getting the bagel. <laughs> anyway, one really big family celebrated a really big milestone. A 99-year-old woman from the Philadelphia suburbs get, just met her, get this, 100th great-grandchild. Yeah, and that's not the only thing this family is celebrating this year. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren has the story of this mega matriarch. Oh, yeah. so, oh, oh. so that's Kohler William, Grandma. Newborn baby Kohler, meet your great-grandma Marguerite Kohler. She knows a thing or two about kids. I think we'll leave him with you. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> you know what you're doing. Huh? You yeah. know what you're doing. In the Kohler clan, great grandma has quite the legacy. 11 children, 56 grandchildren, and then 100 great grandchildren. <laughs> One ginormous family, all started by a woman who grew up as an only child. She was married to my grandfather right before World War II in 1942, um, and they were happily married for 66 years. Baby Kohler named to honor his Grandma Kohler and Grandpa William. And it felt very natural to name him Kohler and William as the middle name, and then we can always call him Cole if we like. And his place as the 100th grandchild, extra special because another 100 milestone is coming up. So you're going to be 100 years old soon and the 100th great-grandchild. So with 100 great-grandchildren, 56 grandchildren, and 11 children, it's safe to say hosting Thanksgiving isn't just an event, it's a village gathering. And we just come in different heats <laughs> and make our presents and, you know, spend some time together, and then we disperse so that everyone can kind of get together at these critical points throughout the year. Adding all four generations up, that's 168 Kohler family members. For the newest member, that's going to be a lot of names to learn. My grandmother's name is Marguerite. She named my mother Marguerite, who named my oldest sister Marguerite, and then my brother's my second daughter is Marguerite as well. But for the OG Marguerite... Does he make you happy? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking how lucky I am. <laughs> that feeling of happiness from holding every great grandkid never gets old. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News. I was going to say they're going to have to wear name tags yeah, at the family seriously. reunion, but maybe they don't because they're all named Marguerite. <laughs> so I guess. <laughs> it is crazy when you see the picture of them all together. It's yeah. like, oh my goodness, Quite that's family. one family. Amazing. Congrats to them. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.